Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining. Um, we're just waiting um, a few minutes to let uh, people come in from their previous meetings um, and things like that, and then we will um, get started. So, um, yeah, welcome. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, we're just uh, giving people time to come in um, before we start the presentation today. Uh, we will be, be uh, starting very shortly. Hi everybody, um, just um, giving us a couple of minutes for everybody to get in, um, we will be starting very shortly, um, so uh, just bear with us for a few minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to kick off now um, with um, this session. Um, just a, a quick request if um, everybody could be um, on mute. Um, I meant to unmute me, so I declined that. Okay, thank you, Anna. Sorry, apologies about that. Um, yeah, everybody, um, if you could um, just make sure you're on, on mute so we don't um, get un uninterrupted. Uninterrupt um, we are today here to um, cover off um, the fourth session in our latest um, Service Operations Workspace Launch and Learn series. Um, and today we're going to um, have the first of two sessions around um, modern change management in um, service operations workspace. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction to the people that you're gonna be hearing today um, and a little bit of information about this program. And then I will hand you over to my colleague who will um, take you through uh, the rest of the session. Um, any questions or anything you have, um, if you could use, um, hold on, let's just see, do we have the Q&A or is that not there today again? It looks like it's not there again, so okay. we'll have to use chat. Okay, Sorry. yeah, any questions, put them in chat um, and um, we will um, keep an eye on that and uh, come back to you uh, throughout the session, um, either answer you direct or um we will uh, pose the question to our presenter today. Okay, so introduction. So my name is Jim Wright. I'm here um, at ServiceNow as an outbound product manager within the IT service management business unit. Um, I've been with ServiceNow um, for about a year now, um, 25 years in ITSM. I know I, I don't look it. Um, I've been working on the platform for around eight years um, now, probably moving towards nine. Um, previously working as a as a consultant and architect, direct with um, customers and partners. Um, and my role within um, ServiceNow um, is is working on improving adoption and awareness of service operations workspace through prescriptive guidance and collaborative work with customers and partners. 
such as um, sessions like we have today here. And I am joined today by my colleague, Daniel Davidson. Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there. Yeah. Um, so my name is Daniel. I think I know quite a lot of you on the call. I actually bumped into you from time to time. Um, apologies for the informality of my background. Uh, when I try and select a virtual background, it just cuts me out as well. So I took the lesser of two evils, which is seeing me over not seeing me. Um, uh, so I've been with service now for over 10 years, um, worked in the field in ITSM implementations, running uh, one of the teams uh, implementing ITSM out of uh, Northern Amir and uh, was led the architecture team out of the UK after that and then joined the product team uh, a couple of years ago and I own change management as well as uh, service level management um, for service now. Uh, so I own the overall change products as well as its implementation, implementation in service operations workspace. Great, yep. thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do today is uh, launch a poll. And I can't see, here we go. Um, okay, so we're gonna launch off our, our, our only poll of today, which is around um, where you are in terms of your, um, your journey for SOW. We're doing this at the start of every session that we're running right at the moment. Um, just to kind of get a feel in terms of where people are um, with that journey. This is the second series of Launch and Learns that we've done. Um, so it's always good to kind of get a, a temperature check on, on where people are as well. So um, we are looking to get to around about 75% of people answering. We're just below that at the moment. So um, I'll give it a couple more seconds for people to jump in and uh, give us their answers. And yeah, I think we're pretty much there. Okay, so let's share the results on that. And so we can see that um, the majority of the people that have answered here are uh, just getting started with their journey in SOW. So this is, this is really good. Um, the ability to kind of get to you guys at this stage and, and help influence you. Um, we see that as, as a really good opportunity now. So um, that's really good. What are we going to get from today then? So we're running these on a weekly um, basis, covering specific areas around the extended personas now um, after our first session was focused on um, the tier one persona. Um, we're looking for feedback, so ask us the question, um, make sure we understand how you want to use the tool, because your feedback is what drives the improvements that um, people like Daniel will take to our in engineering teams. And we want to help you move forward as quickly and as easily as possible. And then after the sessions and, and also within our, our sessions, We'll also share information, documentation, um, polls and things like that. And again, help us to understand how it was, any feedback that will make this experience better for you as well. So what are we looking for? We're looking to understand how we can improve your adoption, accelerate your adoption of service operations workspace. What do you need from a documentation perspective? Are we actually doing it right? Are we asking ourselves the right questions and interpreting your answers correctly? And what's what's not there that you think should be? And the benefit from you is you get to influence us. You get to you get to provide your feedback, which will help drive forward um, the direction of the product. And also, we start to bridge um, an enablement and awareness gap. Um, that, that always keeps coming up, discussions with colleagues um, and with customers so that you can be aware how we intended the product to be used um, and um, walk through that with you so that you can be on the correct path um, to actually achieving value as quickly as possible. So as I said, this is session number four. Um, we have two sessions left in this series um, after today. And today we're going to be talking about configuring, uh, configuring uh, modern change management in SOW um, and why, why we are using the term modern change management now. OK, so um, I've got a, a great group of people behind me um, who will be helping to answer your questions as well. Um, and um, I'm going to hand over now to um, 
my colleague Daniel. The first thing that we're ever going to talk to you about, if you've been with us before, you will be aware of this slide, um, is the safe harbour notice. So there may be um, positions and times within today where we will talk to you about um, potential new features or functionality. Xanadu is due to be released next week, so I'm sure that um, there may be some points or conversations around what will be available to you next week. Um, as, as always, um, please only base any decisions you make on um, generally available features and products um, and don't make any purchasing decisions based on anything that's not um, available at this time. Okay, with that, um, I'll hand over to Daniel. Dan, do you want to present or um, shall I be the slide master? Uh, you can carry on with the slides if you want, uh, okay. but there's only a few of them. Okay. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so the first thing to land on really, and this is really important to service operations workspace for reasons that will become apparent as I talk, um, but a model-based approach to change is something that we're promoting in service now. It's been around for a long time. And change models allow you to step away from the ITIL change models whilst using them in parallel, but they allow you to configure changes that can be done in ways that are purpose-driven for that bit of the organization. And that simplifies the change process and allows it to work with more velocity and handle more volume. So if you have a change process that's specific to an area of the business, like patching or infrastructure, or maybe a specific um, application like SAP, it allows them to tailor the change process to be fit for the data that they can provide, the templates that they may use, um, and also the process that they need to follow. So for instance, patching has a slightly different process that we go through and change. It's not always the same as the other changes that go into normal. And what we found is that by bunching all the changes together in normal change, most of what we do, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, we create a normal change process. It's a bit of a monster. So next slide, please, Jim. So in here, we've got our ITIL change models that we know and love. And we have standard change, which is our repeatable changes, which are low risk. And we do them through the use of template and they don't have approval on them. Um, anything else that isn't happening is an emergency, an emergency change being something that's happening in retrospect or something that we maybe have command and control. We have something we need to be done right now. And we need to make a change with very low lead time. Everything else falls in normal change. And that means there's a lot of changes in normal change. There's a lot of different types of change in normal change. Jim, next slide. Oh, we've got a slightly dodgy slide here. So these are the these are the different attributes of the changes. You have things like approvals, business rules, workflows, state models, templates, and tasks. Um, and those become more complex as we put more and more changes through the normal change process. So we have lots of branching, lots of if statements, lots of conditions that say, if it's this type of thing, then do this with it. If it's this type of thing, do this with it. That makes normal change very complex. And it also makes things like the change form very difficult to fill in because you have lots of fields possibly on the change form which aren't relevant to the change at that stage that you're raising it for that particular purpose. And that's where service operations workspace comes in. So as we look at these, or as we declutter these, these attributes that we have on the changes, we move into a more purpose-driven change. We can make the change form and the change process more specific to that particular purpose, to that user group who are using the change. And we can provide them possibly with some options around templating, and more on that to come, which will make raising the change easier, will make the data that goes into the change more standardized, and will make the change process better, will make compliance better, will make the change easier to raise and easier to process, so make it make you able to handle more velocity and more change. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in here we're seeing the different changes that we have. We have infra changes, DevOps changes, cloud infra changes, all within normal. And we also have an unauthorized change within emergency change, right? So these are changes which have been used because ITIL only has three types. We don't have an unauthorized change type in ITIL, so we have to use emergency change for it. Actually, those things have different attributes. And an authorized change may be something that's fairly inconsequential. We just need to record it, but we need to approve it in hindsight. Whereas an emergency change is normally being done because there's something consequential happening or has happened. So we need to have different levels of approval on those things. And that has to be handled by that single process. The same with normal change. So if we're doing something like patching, we may have a different state flow. We may have different approval mechanisms. Patching changes tend to have a lot of work done up front. They tend to need more approval around when they're scheduled than what's actually happening. And they are fairly standard in terms of what we're filling in on the patching change, but they're not standard changes because they're not necessarily low risk. Um, and they're not necessarily something you want to have that's so repeatable you'd have it in your standard change catalog. So it falls a bit between the two. Next slide, 
please, Jim. I'm going to come into what service operations works better in a second. And then we also have DevOps change, which can either sit within normal change or standard change, and it's neither really. It doesn't fall within standard change because it's not repeatable and low risk. But you want it to happen quickly, and you don't want it to end up necessarily going to cab, so you can't put it within normal change. We have to compromise, and quite often it ends up in standard change. And what we're doing with change models is allowing a different way of working, a way that allows us to work in the way that those teams uh, are their process those teams need from change management to make them work as fast as possible and efficiently as possible and also presenting forms which work in a way which is tailored to their process and taking advantage of the data they have so pulling in data from devops systems around testing or around pipeline runs pulling in information maybe for patching from other systems that we're doing the planning for the patching maybe our release management system okay next slide please jim so by moving these changes out of normal change, what we do is we create some federated change models. These work alongside the models for our ITIL changes. So we have three models out of the box for our ITIL changes. We also have some other models, federated change models we're calling them, um, that work alongside those ITIL change models. So the idea is you continue using the ITIL change model for as long as you need to for a given change. That's whilst you develop new change models, which allow you to be more purpose-driven. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we can go on one more for this. Okay, so this is just showing us our our um, our adoption journey for change, and what we're doing is we're suggesting a way of adopting change. And the first step, um, it wasn't quite what I was expected to see here, but the first step is adopting change models, and then we can do things like we can start building in new flows, new approval policies. We can start being dynamic with the data that we've got in approval policies, we can start looking at things like success scores. We can start looking at the data provided on the change. And really change models are central to doing this because the data provided in each of the different models may be slightly and subtly different to the other models in, in that we have. So by adopting change models first, we have a way that we can start leveraging data. We can have a way of being more dynamic with change. We can make change work better. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. Okay, we can go to the demo now. This is the roadmap slide, which I'm going to show the demo. So if I just take you into service operations workspace and kind of bring it all together. Green. Uh, and we can see that we have um, that we have our homepage, our landing page. And from within service operations workspace, we also have a list of the records that we want to see. So a lot of you are starting to adopt service operations workspace and you'll be familiar with this. And one of the first questions we get is how do we configure the change form? So we have a change form that we've configured to suit our needs. How do we configure that? And there's two ways to think about this. First of all, you've got within the ITIL change uh, par uh, paradigm. So you have a set of states um, that you have for change um, and you represent them here. You can see them represented in the overview tab as different boxes at the top of the screen. So these represent the state flow um, of, our, of our change. And below that, we've got boxes that allow us to see the attributes of that change. So the things that are important to us at the time, I'm gonna show you how you configure this from within uh, ServiceNow so that you can make it specific for that model of change. And the reason for doing this, the reason it's so important to start adopting change models is, what, what users are seeing here varies for each state of the change. It may be that during the new stage of the change, you don't really need to capture the dates the change is happening. You just want to log the change. You want to make it really easy to log the change. You want people to start thinking about the scope and impact. But it's not until we get to assess and authorize that those details become critical. And what we can do within ServiceNow, within Service Operations Workspace, is we can highlight those fields to people. We can give them actionable things like set schedule here. We've got a button which will open up the right dialogue for us to see the right screen for people to be able to schedule their change. So what we're doing is by using the overview tab, we're providing a purpose-driven form for change management. We still have the other details that we have in the change, right? In here, we still have the change request in all its glory with all of its fields in. You know, you have mass update of CI class in there, which is something we're working on for a new release. Um, and you have things like category and model and type and state. You can set all these fields. The point of using the overview tab in service operations workspace is it cuts down the clutter of what people are seeing and focuses in, them in on what they need to fill in, the tasks they need to do at that stage of the change. On the right-hand side as well, we see record information. You can see in here, we're presenting the risk of the change on the right-hand side. And we can do things like view our risk assessment or look at the assignment group and reassign the change. So on the right-hand side, we've been given relevant information to that stage of the change, and we're also being given actions that we can take if we need to contact someone, reassign, or view the risk information. 
happy. So what does all this mean? I'm going to go now, I'm going to go into create a change record. And again, this is forward looking. So we're showing you some early, uh, uh, an instance that's got some uh, engineering work that's been done, which we hope to release very soon. Uh, you can see in here that we've got our change catalog. So when I go into create a new change, I'm given this option to create a new change from a catalog. So this is similar to the way we did it in UI16. This is similar to the interface we had for that, but it's a lot fresher and it's a lot easier to use. You can see in here that we have the ability to select a change from here. We've got our change models. We've got emergency change in there as ever a normal change, but we've also got our pre-approved standard change templates. And from here, we can go and select uh, with facets, we can go and select what groups we want to see. So we can make it really easy to search a change. That's a feature that's coming in a, in a forward-looking release, but we're making it really easy to search for the changes you need to see. And from there, we can go in, we can select a change, and we can open that change, and we can complete the record. So this is the idea of the change catalog. And as we go forward with ServiceNow, and again, looking to for further releases, we're looking to, en to enhance the use of templates within change. So from within Service Operations Workspace, the user will go in to raise a change, and they will have templates available to, to them for, for all the change models. So what you've got is you've got a model that handles your, your flow, your, your process for the change. But that should be a little bit hidden from the user. What they're doing is they're going in and they're choosing a template which has the content for their change if possible. We'll still have the models there if you don't have a template. But the idea is more and more we'll have templates that are a starting point that fill in some of the details for that change that use a specific model of change. So kind of like we do now for standard change, but opening up that up for changes that maybe need some approval or maybe have a slightly different process. So again, adopting models is really central to the journey in service operations workspace. A lot of the features we're building are around using the functionality we have that we think is really valuable and provides good outcomes around change models. And this is one of them, the catalog, being, having faceted searches, being able to search really quickly for a template that you have, being able to have your standard change proposals in service operations workspace, being able to manage those proposals and being able to propose templates really easily so that we can create standardization within change management. Okay, I'm going to go back to the overview tab, a slightly different instance in here. So you can see in here, we, we can see that the change, we're being shown the states of the change. So again, this is something that's available if you're using change models. It will show you the states of the change. And as we said before, when we're using change models, we may not have all those states or we may not have them in the same order. Okay, this is because things like for uh, an, an authorized change, the change has already happened, right? We would see less of these states. We don't want to have a new change because an authorized change is generally raised automatically. Uh, we may not need to see a new state. Um, we want to see the authorized state happen um, after it's been reviewed because the change has happened already. So review quite often happens first in an unauthorized change. So this order would be changed. The state model would show us that we have review first and then we have authorized and then we have closing the change or canceling the change. So again, from within service operations workspace, we get a really nice visual view of the states the change is flowing through, where it's going to go next. And then below that in the overview page, we have the actionable panes that we have, like for instance, at the moment, it implement me want to add a task. So we can click on there and it will open the dialogue to add a task to the change. And it opens and we can add various tasks. Um, but add scope and impact. Again, we can go in here and we can add, um, we can see the affected CIs and we can add the, the configuration item, the service offering, we can show what's impacted by the change. So we're, we're surfacing the parts of the change form that people need to see at the state of the change that they're in. So if I go back and show you how this is configured. So if we go in here, there's a workspace container. And if we go in here, we can see the overview container. So again, coming back to why I talked about change models at the start. So out of the box, we provide you with a, with, with a single set of of overview models for each of the states that are used in normal standard and emergency change. So we're providing a starting point for your ITIL changes. You may find that you end up with different states. You know, in here we've seen customers with things like with um, application performance monitoring type changes, uh, SRM type changes. We're seeing that we have things like we have states where people are uh, talking about the error budget and, and understanding the error budget. So we may have different states within the change. We may have different states per model in the change. So it may be that you want to show a slightly different form in the new state for a DevOps change than you would in a normal change. Or you may want to show a slightly different overview page um, for a uh, patching change than you would an infrastructure change. So the idea is here, we're creating a configurable interface for users to be able to fill in the details they need at that stage of the change. And that is purpose-driven. It's specific to the model they're using. So the process they're following is defined by the model. And what's captured 
it's what we need to capture is defined in the overview page. And this ties in with some of the functionality we can see with models when I show it a little bit later. So if we go into here, we can see we can configure into it. In here, we can configure, configure the overview cards that are shown for that state. So we can add these and remove them. We can show at the, at the moment for the new state, these are the particular overview cards that we want to show. And so this is configurable from within Service Operations Workspace. You can build your own using, uh, using UI Builder. So you can build your own pages that people see in the overview page. But for the moment, we're just going to see what's in these particular points. So you can see in here, um, we're pointing it towards, so in, in, in the summary state and the new state is showing us that that, that particular page will be at that particular time in the change request. So, And you can see in here, we have different change overview cards, again, out of the box that you can assign to different states in the change process. So this allows us to make the change overview configurable. So if we, for a moment, look at how this ties into how we configure models. So from, again, we can look at the change models that we provide out of the box. If you ignore the OT change ones for, for the moment, they're loaded by instance because of operational technology. We have in here our, our ITIL changes, normal, emergency, and standard change. And we also have one for an authorized change, for instance. I'm going to go into that one. So you can see here by using this change model, we can configure that overview page to to be to meet the fields that we need to put in to, to take that person through the change flow. And from within the change model, we can select what fields are filled in automatically. Maybe you can see the reason I picked this one is we want always want an authorized to be set to true from within this model. So we're pretty filling some of the some of the fields on the form based on that change model. You can see in here we've defined the model states. So for an authorized change, we go authorized review and then close. We don't have all the states. So again, going back to service operations workspace, from within that overview card, we will only see those states. And from within those states, we can configure what fields are shown and what actions people can take from within the overview card. If we go into authorized here, we can see we've also configured in here when it moves from authorized to closed, what conditions we want to be there to make it so it does move automatically if we want to automatically close it after it's also been authorized, or what we what we want to put in there maybe on a new change that prevents it being moved to assess until those fields are, set, uh, are filled in. So again, tying this in with what's on the overview page, you want to present those fields on the overview page, and you want to ensure they're filled in using the change model. David. Quick question for you. So yeah. um, how do we, what determines whether you, and where do you determine which model to use? Did I miss that? Okay, so at the moment, uh, I did I did show it. Maybe I wasn't quite clear enough. So um, uh, first of all, well, there's two things, actually. One of them I haven't shown. So first of all, when you go into the catalog, there will be a model that you're probably used to using. So people from Infra will be used to using the Infra model. Yeah. Okay. Actually, going forward, and we haven't got this functionality in yet, but going forward, we want to present templates to people, right? So that they get something that they're like, they're making a firewall change, right? Maybe it's a Cisco firewall change. That's the template. And that will help fill in some of the data on the change, some of the content of that change form, but it will also select the model for them. So we, we, we get that models for change managers are really understandable and something that fits in well with what they want to do, because you want to drive and optimize the process and change models control process. What we want to do is make it easy for the users to understand that because they're doing something with a purpose, right? They're doing something like making a Cisco firewall change. They don't need to know what model it is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's got a template. It will select the model for them. So that's why we're enhancing the catalog so that you can have a load of templates in there and you can audience them to certain people. You can have pin templates that you go to a lot. You pick the template and it will select the model for you. From within the change model itself as well, at a very base level, we can control who can access that change. So in here, we've got read roles. So we can make sure that only the right people can see that particular change. At the moment, we're, we're opening that to pretty much everybody. Um, but if I go to advanced security, you can see in here, we've got um, user criteria that allows to be really specific about who can see and who can't see that particular change model from within the catalog or from within the new change process. Um, obviously, this is applicable to UI 16, which is the UI I'm in now, as well as the service operations workspace UI. Um, and we've got can write as well, which is the ability to edit that change if you're kind of truly federated and you're given organizational units the ability to create their own change models. So there's two there's two layers, really. First of all is 
you know, from a security point of view, who do I want to be able to open change into this thing? What what roles should they have? And that's configured here for that model. The second part of it is, you know, when we move forward and we have templates for it, we would hope that would really help people speed up the process and understand what model they're going to use implicitly. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So I think now we can move to Q and A, uh, Jim. Sorry, mute button not working, user error. Um, yeah, I think, um, so uh, thanks thanks for that, Daniel. I think um, that was a really good overview um, in terms of, of where we currently are. Um, I know that there's been a couple of questions already um, in, the, um, in the chat, um, but yeah, if uh, anybody's got any questions that they would, would want to ask um feel free to take yourself off mute and um we'll do our best to answer them for you okay james hi there thanks great presentation i like that a lot um i noticed that when you're creating a new change in service operation workspace the interceptor page that comes up refers to the pre-approved changes as standard change templates is that because it's accessing them through the same receptacle as like the the record producers did or is that just the labeling on that uh categorization kind of both um okay. <laughs> the, the labeling we've got at the moment is is um something we need to review i think with with the kind of functionality we've got going forward where we're looking at a lot more change models and a lot more templates right um so pre-approved is is standard change right it's yep. it was meant to be a clearer indication and kind of moving slightly away from the ITIL wording because i think as you know globally it is moving away from the ITIL wording and, and to, to adopt change models we also want to get people's head out of that space we're yeah. not getting rid of idle changes you know they're still in there we still have normal change we still have standard change we still have emergency change but we kind of feel like there's a lot of changes which are they're, they're you have standard changes which are pre-approved which is the traditional standard changes and then there are a lot of low risk changes in organization that may require some approval like you may have low risk changes you may have something that is a standard change when it's in sub-production during a maintenance window but isn't a standard change when it's in a production system or on a critical system or, not, or during a blackout window. And you can set this using dynamic approval policies, using your approval policies. So the point is that you have these traditional standard changes, which is for your truly pre-approved, repeatable, templated changes. And then you have sets of templates which, which leverage other models, which may be like a low-risk change model, which has some dynamic logic built in to say, okay, it, it doesn't need approval in, in sub-prod in a maintenance window. It needs limited approval in production if it's a non-critical system during a maintenance window. But if you start doing it during a blackout window or to a critical system, that's going to need to go to cap, right? So that's that's where we're going with this. Sounds good. Thanks. I was uh, thinking that the pre-approved nomenclature is preferred, and I like I like that. So if that's the way you guys are going, cool. if there's some suggestion there, that might be uh, something to take away from this. Yeah, the, the world is divided on pre-approved. and Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, believe me. I mean, can't pre-approved. Good. It's a hot topic. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking to add more labels as well. So we're looking to make that a little bit more enhanced so you can so you can have more categories of change, if you like, in there. So make the catalog. A awesome. Bit Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, there was a really good um, question um, in the chat around kind of the the uh, the adoption and the transition from the the kind of idle models into the the new change models. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a, a brief piece on that. I know, having seen you speak before, that you talk about that kind of iterative approach and maybe kind of you know picking some teams to to actually identify those additional models. Where's the question? I want to just read it. So I get um, you read out the full question. Yeah. So um, is your suggestion to not transfer our team to use change within SOW until this is released and configured? Um, so, I mean, yeah, the, the answer to that is not at all, you know, start moving forward, but perhaps how you could how you could kind of do it iteratively move to the new change model piece sort of thing. Yeah, so first of all, change is effectively a risk and compliance process, right? So you have to be careful about changing stuff with change. Um, you know, it's kind of um, maybe a bit controversial to say it, but if, if change gets changed wrong, then bad things happen, right? If incident gets changed, 
bad things happen, but they're not as bad as if change gets changed wrong, right? So adopting change in service operations workspace, we need to be really careful that we've got things like feature parity. I showed before that we're doing things that, you know, I, I touched on before, we've got uh, things like mass update of CI. I don't know if, how many people on the call use that. You can comment in the chat if you want to, but mass update of CI and proposed change is something that wasn't available in service operations workspace. So if you were using that, you, you couldn't move over to it because it wouldn't be there. Um, we're releasing that into service operations workspace. Um, so we're reaching feature parity. Um, I'll show you a couple of other things. I did have a second half of the demo to do if we had time, which we probably will do, where we've got things like standard change proposal in service operations workspace as well. So you can start not, you know, we don't like the idea of you having to switch between the different UIs. That, that's that's not functional, right? So we want you to be able to adopt service operations workspace and do all of change in it. Um, we also have the ability to configure things like change models, approval policies from within service operations workspace, just preventing list and form views. And maybe going forward, we'll have some better ways of doing that, some kind of like more guided setups. Who knows? But the idea is that the, the enhancements are making towards change. There will be things that happen within the data model. Um, there will be things happening, new features that come out, things like uh, CAB, Change Advisory Board within service operations workspace. You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have cab happening in, in a workbench in UI 16, and then the rest of change happening in SOW, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a great user experience to have that. Um, again, if we get time, I can show you some, some uh, previews of what we're doing and what we're hoping to do around cab coming in our February release. Um, but in order to move it to service operations workspace, what we also have to do is make sure it's fit for purpose with things like with modern change, with things like change models, with things like how cab is being done these days, which is a lot more dynamic, a lot more kind of pre-cab work. We want to make that experience really good when people move across. So the short answer to the question, and it was a multi-part question, one of the short answers is move across when you're ready to move across. We feel like feature parity is very almost reached right now. And we have a few things coming to make feature parity complete which should enable you to move across. There are models in there in, in service operations workspace for normal standard emergency change. And you, you can attach your workflows to those models, right? You don't have to use new flows. If you're on workflow and you've got a highly customized change workflow, you can attach it to the change models. We have, um, and I think Jim might post in the chat or, or maybe we'll do something. We have a link across to um, our um, a, a community page, which posts kind of, there's a set of, about six or seven hours of videos um, that take you through these different aspects, right? We've cut some of those up a little bit as well. There's collateral on that site as well. Or if you see slides you want from that site, then you know contact your account team, we can provide that. So we can provide some more context around the journey. It's different for each customer. If you have a highly customized change process, highly customized change form, um, it's gonna be a little trickier to move to SOW because you've got to make those customizations somewhere else. If you're more out of the box, it's easier to move but everyone can move, right? The things I've shown you around the change overview page, how the change is presented, they do allow you to move even if you've got very customized change form. Having things like mass update of CI, having things like proposed change, having things like cab in there gives us feature parity, that allows you to move too. And adoption of change models for normal standard emergency gives you the nice view with the formatted um, state flow and the ability to use the overview card. I'd say that's pretty much a must for moving across to SOW and for it to be fully functional. Mm -hmm. And then adding in additional change models and all the things we talked about templates, that's something you can just do over time. So you don't need to do that right away. You don't need to have a patching change or infrastructure change in there. But you can migrate fairly easily. User existing workflow, all the existing business logic needs to be just tweaked a little bit to use the model field instead of the type field. Again, we cover that on the videos in the other section that Jim will post. Did you find the link, Jim? I can find it to you. I've got it. Janet, yeah. cool. You post that link across. So Jim and Janet's colleagues, Caleb and Greg, I put together a really good series um, on that. So um, they put it together, they got me to present it. So they deserve the credit. Um, have a look at that on YouTube. That takes you through how to move to, to, to change models, how to use approval policies, how to use risk, um, and how that surfaces in change. Um, another example of what we've put into change for each parity is we, we've got a fully featured uh, risk card now that shows you the breakdown of the risk and where the risk was arrived at if you're using, and you should be using, um, our, our advanced risk framework. So... Um, we, we are kind of narrowing the gap from feature parity. We advise you to move to change models. And then when you're there, you'll get more benefit from service operations workspace. And we are rolling out new features all the time. And what we're doing, things like Gen AI um, for change summarization, change risk summarization, which should be coming in November. Those type of things are being rolled out primarily in service operations workspace as well. So if you're a, a, an IT7 Pro Plus customer, you know, definitely there's, there's a lot of benefit from moving to service operations workspace. A lot of answers for that question. <laughs> 
and and, and as you say, it's a, it was a it was definitely a, a kind of multi tiered question um, that came there. Um, are there so another question in other than the change models? Um, what other benefits are there um, to move to SOW for change management? Okay, so. Um, First of all, there are benefits beyond change management. So, you know, the, the, the service operations workspace is an operations workspace. It's designed to do change man management as, as well as other things. Um, change is the center of my world, but it's not the center of the IT's world, of IT's world, right? You can do incident in service operations workspace. You can do problem. We've recently uh, migrated problem into service operations workspace as well. It's one place where you can do what you need to do. And it's, it's really about having more of a persona-based journey, right? So in, in the UI16, we had process-based journeys. You opened an incident, you opened a change, you opened a request, or you opened a problem, right? And, and that was that was more or less ITSM. Um, with service operations workspace, it gives you the ability to kind of go left and right to look at nice um, item diagrams that appear in on service operations workspace, to have different views for say, we've got a, a tier one view, which is for your service desk agents, which is more about answering things on time, understanding what's in the queue. And then it, we have other experiences like the ITOM experience, which are more focused on alert management and understanding what alerts are coming in and root cause analysis there. So there's a lot of reasons to move to service operations workspace. And actually by closing the parity gap between service operations workspace and UI16, by making service operations workspace more performant, so it performs better, by optimizing it, uh, and by making it easier to configure, we feel like we, we're now in a place where it's it's, a, it's an easy move and a, and a beneficial move to make. Um, as well as that, new features we're building, like our enhancements to CAB, will only be available in service operations workspace as a full experience. So the data models there, you can use it in UI16, but the whole, the whole idea of, of, of the workspace you interact with CAB with is in service operations workspace, and that's coming uh, next year. Yeah, so, and that's that's an important thing. Um, the you know major incident management, which was released um, previously, that is that is the updated version of that is only available in service operations workspace. So we will we will start to be in a position. We're moving towards full feature parity from UI sixteen, um, and we will move to a position where service operations workspace will be more feature rich. Um, than UI 16 as well. And, and there was one person asking if it's possible to see that standard change proposal at all. Daniel, is that something that you can show briefly absolutely, or not? Absolutely. I was going to just see if we had time. Awesome. Okay to do some of that yep. stuff. <laughs> okay, you should be seeing now. So if we go into... Now, uh, this, this again, this is a, an engineering instance. It's something that, you know, I can click on things and uh, they may be working on stuff. So taking a bit of a risk here, but you can see in here on on, the, on our list, on the default list for change. So this is within here, the list for change. You see, we've got changes we had before, but we also had change templates. And in there, we can see we've got all templates. So we can, we can see the templates we have already. Uh, we can make proposals for change. So if we want to, you're in the way here, the, the card is in the way. Okay, so we can go here and we can go when there's a new standard change proposal. And we can fill in that template just as we did in UI 16. We've got the same fields in there. So we have a new standard change proposal. We can work with the life cycle of the change as well. So if we go in here, we have, uh, oh, I've got the proposal. Uh, you can see in here, we have proposal type. We can modify an existing template like we could before and that will hold the versioning, or we can retire an existing template from within here. So again, from service operations workspace, we have the ability to, to go into uh, our change. Now, if I just go into here and I go into new change request, uh, from here, we can also propose a new template from within the catalog. So if the template isn't there, and obviously you can limit who can propose a template, right? we're not suggesting that everyone who has access to the change catalog can propose a template, but from within here, you can work with change templates as well. So it's a nice, easy experience. It's kind of front and center, and you can work with some of the change templates. And again, we're hoping to enhance this to be used across all models. So you can work easily with your templates in your group. You can propose them. You can have them accepted. You can review them as before, uh, just like we've done the change, but they'll be open to all models. Okay. But the, Dan, the Dan, is there any the categories? You, sorry. Go ahead. Dan, Dan Go is ahead. there anything you can show us in terms of 
ability to link incidents to changes. So I've seen it on the incident side where you can get presented some changes that may have caused the incident. But is there anything on the change side that... We're, we're working on it. I haven't got anything I can show you, but we're working on it. It's really important. Um, it's, it's kind of tricky because... Uh, and it's something that we're going to we're going to crack. But uh, if you have you have if you have a change that's unsuccessful, it can still it can cause incidents. If you have a change that's successful, it can cause incidents. The incidents are sometimes kind of nebulous, right? Being able to suggest incidents for a change, they happen around the same time in the same system. It relies a little bit on the data model that you've got. So, for instance, if you have a service that you link to your change or a service offering that you link to your change or an application service that you link to your change, a higher level entity, one of those logical entities. And then that also has incidents linked to it. It's a lot easier for us to use things like machine learning to find incidents and and uh, and, and, and other, other changes that may be related in terms of like, you know, looking at change success in the past. It's like this change is similar to these changes and these changes had these incidents. So therefore you should be more aware of what could happen on the change you're doing now. And maybe the risk isn't set appropriately. That's something we're looking at in our risk summarization with Gen AI. So ITSM Pro Plus. For ITSM Pro customers, we have clustering and machine learning that can suggest uh, similar incidents. At the moment, we don't have that in platform because it wasn't something that we found to be particularly successful because of the reasons I've mentioned, because of the divergence of data models, because of the whole fuzziness of it. It wasn't something we were particularly satisfied with suggesting automatically. Suggesting similar changes is a lot easier. So, for instance, suggesting similar incidents is a lot is the same thing as change suggesting similar changes. Uh, it's quite because you've got the same fields on those two records. It's a lot easier to build similarities between the two things. Changes to incidents is a lot trickier, right? It's something we need to do. It's it's something we, we're making really good progress tracking. I will pick it up with you afterwards, David, and we can have a conversation. I'll demo through that, and if other people are interested, we can maybe set, set up a session or do something more at scale to show you what we're working on as we as we come to you know come further down the line. So it's not just over to David, by the way, he asked the question, but other people as well. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, there was somebody else had a question. Yes, Cyrus speaking, um, I had a question. So um, imagine a situation where other tools are being used to, I don't know, application development or whatever. So maybe the example of SAP, yeah, SAP Solution Manager, uh, where activities are done to, I don't know, develop a solution to a bug fix, and mm. it goes through development, then testing, then UAT, all in Solution Manager. Um, but you want a change record to then be created in ServiceNow for that final step, you know? So all the heavy lifting's happening in one tool, but you use service now just to record that last step of right now's the time we're going to deploy this to production. Um, you can't move away from solution manager and completely use NG now because solution manager has certain interfaces to SAP, you know, so you can do something in solution manager and it will update a, a SAP system or whatever. So I'll be interested if you could make a comment on how you can connect, join up, um, service now to these other tools or or maybe even to other modules within um service now so for example the agile dev module or whatever so you're yeah. just getting the last part of the story you know what i mean appearing yeah. in really good change. question and, and and it's what we're thinking as well so first of all within the change models you know you may well have an sap model within there it's something we commonly come across when we analyze what models people are using because we do look around and see what people are using sap and then line of business systems the big systems people have out there, people are setting up a, the, a, you know, a specific change model for that system. And, and we know SAP, um, whilst it's not like a DevOps, necessarily a, a, a DevOps system, uh, it could be done with DevOps, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, it's a shift left system. So what you have is you have a lot of the change processes shifted left into technologies that SAP have within their platform, transports are built, they're tested, and then they're released, right? So you have more of a kind of link to release management for within SAP because they, 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 they bundle things together with transport and they will do releases. So first of all, there's a link through and a plug for me for um, a digital product release. Okay, so that handles the high level. And we can post a link in the chat, Janet, if you can find it to Colin's DPR session. But um, the that, that allows us to handle the high level gates, which are more relevant to an SAP release um, than the change process. So it's like, you know, has this thing been tested? Have we done operational handover for this thing? 
uh, those gates are handled in digital product release. The link through to change then is the specific commits we're doing, so the specific parts of that change. And again, that's connecting through what you're doing and, and the actual specific time you're making a change, when you're going to be taking the system down, that's relevant to change management. That's not release, that's change management. So you're saying that at this particular time, there'll be reduced reduce resilience or the system will be down or, or maybe there's just no impact, we're just recording a change. And it could be that you need to capture some information in the change, like the change model will tell you the process it's following is because it's SAP, it can only be raised by SAP. So we've done approval in the SAP system and we can evidence that in the SAP system, so we don't need an approval step. Now, by taking that out of normal change, we're not having a route through normal change that allows you to move something in with no approval because we've selected SAP as a, as a thing. You know, it's like we're doing an SAP change, we've categorized it such our compliance is linked to that model, and we do it in SAP and we can demonstrate it. If we have data we can pull across from SAP, then you can connect to SAP. And I'm not sure what the scenario is with connectors. I know it's not something that our DevOps tools provide as a connection basis, but uh, if there are other systems that we're doing, with, say, you know, using JIRA or ADO for their planning, they may not have a full DevOps pipeline. They may just be doing the planning. Again, our DevOps tools can provide that visibility and you can link those things into the change. So if I go to our roadmap slide, you can see here, attach work items to changes. So uh, the next okay. release of operations workspace will have the ability to attach uh, work items to all changes. So things like stories, um, features, that kind of stuff, where you'll be able to attach to the change by kind of manually browsing to it, uh, clicking on the button and manually browsing to the artifacts that you have in ADO or JIRA via the DevOps connection to those tools. So again, mm -hmm. looking forward, we're hoping to, to, to move that in and have things like Selenium results within a right. change that you can change. And and that link that's just been posted in there by Janet, that, will that give more details on that, or or is this you know linking a separate topic? So it's a separate topic. It's digital product release. It's relevant because the SAP type things, you know, generally that that kind of package is is highly related to a release. Right, it's got several features, maybe several changes within it. Um, it doesn't have to be, but that's generally where I see customers taking that. That, that that thing it's it's there's a lot more kind of higher level checks for an sap release because it's generally a big thing that's bundled into a transport there will be changes as well and that's what i'm talking about with the attaching work items that attaching other structured data to the change and the change model so it's two answers really one is the mm. release process we can handle using a release process within service now the change process we can handle by having a specific model for that change um, tailoring that process to that particular system, making sure that only those people can raise that change, only SAP engineers can raise that change, or that it's automatically raised uh, via an integration. And also the integrations allow us to populate work items in ServiceNow and to reference them from the change using the specific item on the roadmap we've got here for 2024 at the bottom, attach work items to change. Yeah, and, and that link itself will take you, there's one at the bottom of that article that is the webinar introducing digital product release, but there's also one that's specifically DPR and change management, how they tie together, which is just a six minute video that will give you the idea of how it's pulling the release components out of change and keeping them in the release side of things um, and, and how it would go forward into change, which would be the same idea of how you would deal with a model for that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I did have another question as well, but I don't want to hog it in case somebody else had one. <laughs> I, I have a quick one that that um, so we you talked about the change models and so so it's a two it's kind of a two part but simple questions so if I have if I have can I still use the, like the conflict calendar and and you know for so so if I have a so if say it's an application release but but I need to make sure the environment is is up and available and I want need to check the the um, the the calendars maybe for one of the other models of changes. You know, um, so is is that is that can I go across the two environments and look at different calendars, release calendars? So the the calendars. Uh, okay, so the change calendar, the forward shift of the change, change scheduling is available in Service Operations Workspace. Yes. So we I clicked on it before, and you can see from within the change, it opens up the change calendar, um, and you can see other changes that are happening. Um, what we're hearing from people and what we see is that that calendar can become very complex, right? Especially when you've got a patching right. chain with 500 items on it. It's, it's, it can be very difficult to, to find a time when everything works for 500 items. 
So we're looking at advanced change scheduling. We're looking at things like maybe using um, Gen AI to help with the change scheduling. We're looking at putting change scheduling into the CAB meeting so that you can have a kind of a proactive view of like, okay, we're having an infra change CAB. Here are the high risk changes. Let's get them done. Now let's look at your change schedule. Or for a DevOps team, you know, they may not need, they may not ever go to CAB. But it may be the change advisory that the DevOps cab for that particular set of applications doesn't deal with change approval because the changes are pre-approved. But what it does look at is the loading of changes into Windows. So, you know, so why are you doing 100 changes on a Friday night and making a system potentially unstable when you've got a Monday night window that has virtually no change happening in it? So we want to make enhancements to change scheduling. We want to make it easier to use, more intuitive from within service operations workspace. Uh, but that's yet to come. But for now, we have feature parity point of view of change scheduling in service operations workspace, yes. Okay. Thanks. So more goodness to come on the scheduling because that's always been and always will be a challenge. <laughs> as you do more changes in an organization, scheduling gets more complex, right? And as changes happen faster, um, we've seen organizations that actually, um, it's, it's a bit like bringing the towels to a beach before, you know, in the, in, in the morning, so, so you go in the afternoon, people are actually booking out slots just because they know they need to make changes and they don't know what changes they're making. You know, it, it's becoming a, as people are making changes, scheduling is becoming more fraught. We want to make it easier. We want to make modern change something that happens where you have, you know, regular meetings that discuss the schedule, look at the schedule, discuss best practices around the schedule, et cetera. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I think it's been a really good session. Um, thanks, Daniel, for putting that together for us. Um, thanks, everybody, for your um, participation. Um, did you have anything more that you wanted to show? I think this was probably the last slide that you had, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to something. highlight maybe a couple of things. So. One of the things that customers have asked for, um, I do a lot of customer meetings and um, change content packs. So we want to be able to provide some out the box, some more out the box change models, approval policies, flows, state models, state transitions for you to use as a starting point. So when I talk about things like infra change, when I talk about things like patching change, I want to be able to back that up by having an example that we have given to you in the platform that you can either use or take as a starting point. And I think take as a starting point is important because we don't see the change process as being something that's used completely out of the box. Everyone has their own nuances around the change process. So these give you examples of how you can maybe call success scores from a change approval policy to examine them and then use that as an input to your approvals for a change or how you can look at whether there's any operational incidents on, on a critical system right now and maybe use that as an input for your change approval scores and how you can use risk, how you can use risk conditions, how you can make the state-based flows work. Again, all of it's covered in the other videos, which you have posted in a link probably down there. Um, and uh, yeah, look up those look up those videos and, and have a, uh, and then get back to us with feedback. Um, so the other thing to call out is change advisory board probably landing next February with an initial release and then being enhanced as we go into family release, moving on from there. So CAB in, uh, in SOW is, is gonna be like a modern change CAB. Um, and then we have sort of the change templates as well as part of the change life cycle. So being able to attach change templates to, to more than just standard change. Mass update, post CI changes. If you're not using that now, uh, we'd recommend having a look at it when it's released um, in November. Um, because that is an enhanced kind of user experience for proposing changes. It makes it a lot easier to propose the changes. We've got rid of the kind of old XML view that was really confusing XML views, you know. Uh, so you can see what's being done in a change. You can say, I'm, I'm changing this thing at this time for these CIs. And then when you execute the change, it automatically updates the CMDB to reflect that change. And then say you have discovery, it runs, and it should correspond with the change that's been made. And if it doesn't, you know, you can signal things like unauthorized changes. And it's a whole process. Anyway, we've got a um, massive data CI coming to enhancements to change catalog to make it easier to browse and navigate when you have all your templates in, which we hope you have soon. And for the template standard change templates you have right now, um, overview page enhancements, we're always tweaking that. So in SOW, um, we're making it easier to see the lists. We've got new list features coming in, which have been given by the platform team, which we're embedding into service operations workspace. Uh, we're having, um, we're, we're always thinking about the order and what things come on the card and, and how you see them and how you interact with them. So, you know, as you move through the service operations workspace releases, you'll see enhancements happen all the time to do with usability. 
making changes easier to raise, uh, making changes easier to fill in, and hopefully creating you know a better experience, more velocity, volume, stability, and compliance. Yeah, and one of our users actually asked, how can they get notified of all the updates to SOW and things like that? The easiest way I found is if you go to the ServiceNow store and find SOW Service Operations Workspace for ITSM and subscribe to that particular link, then as soon as there's a new store release, you'll get notified. You'll just get an email saying there's something there and you can take a look at what's available. I like to think people read my release notes as well. Yes. <laughs> Always. Good. Cool. I think we're at okay. time. We're at time. Thank you, Thank you very everyone. much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for your participation. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Janet, and everybody else behind me. Yeah, if you drop we'll me the questions that didn't get if there's any questions that didn't get answered, if you drop them to me, I will answer them either by email or something. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye now.